Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Allison Stimpert. I am a research faculty member here at Moss Landing Marine Labs, and I'm Bree's advisor. Um, so I am very happy to be here today. Bree is my first student, and I'm very proud of her and all that she's accomplished. So this is an exciting day, and I'm just going to give a little introduction to give you some idea and background on um, Bree and her path to getting here today. Um, so Bree started off as a baby, like we all do. <laughs> uh, she was born in Washington. She's got a great family who is, I think, all here today. Um, and apparently she loved dolphins from a very young age, so she's on the right track. Um, uh, before she came to Moss Landing, she did her undergrad at Everett Community College and University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, during that time, she was a NOAA Hauling Scholar and also completed several internships working with dolphins, um, sperm whales, and acoustics on several different projects, um, including one that she sort of, by my understanding, created for herself um, up at NOAA in Seattle. And they liked her so much that they offered her some data to use for a master's thesis. So she came to Moss Landing with a data set in hand, an acoustic data set on Arctic killer whales, um, and a pretty well-defined project idea for her thesis. But I'm not going to steal her thunder. I'm going to let her talk about that with you today. Um, but she also knew at the, at the time that she wanted to get more fieldwork experience and the experience of designing a project and running a project. So she also designed a pilot study on Rizzo's dolphin acoustic behavior in Monterey Bay. And this project was really her passion while she was at Moss Landing. Um, she developed it from the ground up. She learned how to drive a boat. She trained and wrangled a whole slew of volunteers, many of whom are probably in the audience today. Thank you for your help. Um, and she found Rizzo's dolphins, which we didn't even know if she would be able to do, and was able to successfully record data and um, acoustic and social behavior data from them. Um, she also took me out a few times, which was really fun for me, so I liked this project a lot. Um, she also, apparently this is a theme in our lab, uh, got seasick a lot. <laughs> and um, I don't think this was something, I think this was something she knew about herself. Um, I don't have any pictures of her getting seasick, I'm not going to do that to her, but I do have kind of a funny <laughs> story that she told me one time when we were out on the boat, I asked her if she had had breakfast, and she said that she was starting to be sort of strategic in her snacks. Um, because she had bought this can of gourmet nuts that cost like $15, but she didn't eat it before going out on the boat because she knew she would lose it all. So <laughs> she had instead eaten a very inexpensive rice cake and was saving the nuts for later. So I think that financial responsibility is something that all Moss Landing students really learn <laughs> in several ways. Um, I did take one picture that was sort of a sad moment. I don't know if you remember this, Bree. This was... Um, she just realized that her acoustic recording system didn't work on what I think was the very first time we'd successfully gotten Rizzo's dolphins and gotten everything in the water. She's not very happy at this moment, but I took the picture knowing that she would overcome um, and that there would be happy moments to follow, um, which there were. But not that long after that, she got her um, actual first data back, and this was the moment when she realized she'd actually recorded <laughs> acoustic data. <laughs> So it was very exciting and emotional, and um, I think she really overall earned her nickname that I think a lot of her lab mates called her of puke and rally. <laughs> um, outside of her thesis work, she also worked with me on a big project on the effects of noise and um, survey vehicles on rockfish in Southern California. Uh, she went on a cruise with uh, all the folks at NOAA. This is Bree leaving land for several weeks, wondering how she was going to do. But um, I think she did great. There was, uh, she did lots of work with the equipment, uh, collecting the data, doing analysis before and after. Um, there were other things that happened on the cruise. I wasn't there, but apparently um, you got excited about the fish. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> but uh, she did get a paper out of this as well. She is the second author on a paper that came out last year or earlier this year. So that was a, she was a really big help on that project and really proved herself to be a good scientist all around. Um, Bree is obviously very jovial. She's a really integral part of the vertebra vertebrate ecology lab. Um, helps out with everything from stranding to um, open house to whatever dress up things are happening at the lab. <laughs> um, always with an excellent attitude, and that 
that transcend through her in everything that she did in her thesis. So she was really great to work with. Um, she's also very accomplished. She's leaving Moss Landing with um, six different scholarships. She's given two uh, talks at international meetings. She has the co-authored paper. She was also student body president for two years, if you want to add that to everything, um, and revitalized the Monterey Bay Marine Science Volleyball Tournament, which had been on an 18-year hiatus. Uh, she got that going again in her spare time. Um, so she really takes a lot of initiative and gets things done. She turned in her thesis yesterday, so that's all done. <laughs> And she also found out about a week ago that she has a job um, in San Diego at the National Marine Mammal Foundation as an acoustic research associate, which sounds really cool. You should totally ask her about it. It sounds like a really great job. So it's pretty exciting. And then the last thing I want to mention is that youth and outreach are really important to Bree. She works at the Sanctuary Exploration Center. Um, <laughs> big contingent from there as well. Um, and she also developed an interactive pre-K through 12 program um, teaching kids about marine mammal sounds and ocean noise. And this is really a passion of hers, and I think it's a great quality in, sci in a scientist. Um, so that's been very impressive as well. So that's sort of Brie in a nutshell. Um, as her last name goes, I'm not going to go through it letter by letter. But um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Madrigal is a type of song, and she's apparently also very musical, which goes back to a long history of musical performance with her two sisters, uh, Jadison and Chartelise. And I'm going to show you some of that because <laughs> in her first year here, her mom gave me this whole show that she was in. So it's too good not to share. Oh, it's not going. No. <laughs> Why not? You can hear it. I have the whole thing if you guys want to watch it after. <laughs> but for now, let's hear about some killer whales. All right. Um, well, so Allison, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> You all really got to get some insight into my earlier years, pre-marine science. So, uh, so I'm excited to be here today um, to present to all of you uh, the culmination of what I've been working on the last three and a half or so years here at Moss Landing Marine Labs. And I just want to begin by saying, you know, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm so excited to have so many people that I'm close with, um, whether that be family that's here today, uh, people at the Exploration Center, folks I work with, and uh, folks here at Moss Landing Marine Labs. And so thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. All right. So I will be presenting today on my thesis, um, and it's titled Determining Ecotype Presence and the Call Repertoire of Killer Whales 
from passive acoustic monitoring near Point Hope, Alaska, and the southeastern Chukchi Sea. All right, so communication is very important for many animal taxa. And so animals receive and transmit sound uh, through a variety of modalities um, for, uh, for example, defending territory, mating, group coordination. And so for terrestrial animals, uh, all these examples are of terrestrial animals vocalizing, using sound to communicate. And as scientists, we can study the sounds uh, to better understand presence and absence, for example. So this is an amakihi, this is a endemic Hawaiian bird, um, endemic to Hawaii. And so we can look at the species and look at their vocalizations, um, such as the one pictured here. This is a spectrogram, which I'll go into a little bit more detail in a bit. And it's a picture of sound. So those dark marks here are those bird calls that you see. And so we can look at you know, how uh, much calling is occurring to see presence and absence. And so this is used in management, for example. And sometimes these vocalizations can be very diverse and complex. And so in order to better categorize these vocalizations and sounds that animals make, we can create these what we call vocal catalogs. And so these, for example, these spectrograms here, these pictures of sound that I mentioned, um, are useful tools to be able to describe repertoires um, in species such as the Asian elephant. And so although this uh, repertoire has been uh, designated for this species specifically, we can also look at differences um, among different species such as African and Asian elephant differences. And so, we see in the terrestrial environment that these differences occur. But the terrestrial environment is a little bit different than the marine environment. Um, so in the terrestrial environment, animals can rely on visual cues. But marine mammals, for example, rely on sound due to limited visibility in the marine environment. And so marine mammals take advantage of the efficiency of sound propagation in the ocean. Uh, and as we know uh, sound travels approximately four times faster in water than in air. So it's a very uh, useful conduit for signals to pass through. And so acoustic communication is essential for one of the ocean's top predators, the killer whale. And so killer whales are extremely a social species that live out here. Uh, we get them out here in Monterey um, and they're very uh, cosmopolitan. We see them in almost all of the world's oceans and they've been studied for decades. And so they produce three types of vocalizations. And at this slide is when I'm going to kind of go a little more in detail about what those spectrograms mean. And so we have three types of vocalizations, we'll, which I'll discuss in a minute. But we can see here on the spectrogram, we have time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. And, and so the spectrogram allows us to see these different, for example, whistles or pulsed calls. Um, and so those differences in color indicate amplitude. So those darker colors, so for example, in this black and white example, the dark color is, um, are the higher amplitudes in relation to that you know, whiter ambient noise, background noise. And so killer whales produce three types. They produce echolocation, which is used for feeding, whistles, which are produced in short-term communication, and pulsed calls, which are the most common vocalization produced by killer whales. And so they have these big impacts on ecosystems, and I kind of touched on that earlier. Um, but this impact is really driven by ecotype presence. And there are three types of ecotypes um, of killer whales, residents, transients, and offshore whales. And for the purpose of this talk, we, are, we won't be discussing offshore whales because there's very little known about their vocal repertoires. So we'll be focusing on residents and transients primarily. And so I want to give you a brief rundown on those differences between residents and transients to give you a better idea of how these ecotypes differ. And so the, the one characteristic that many people are familiar with are their diet specialization. So residents are fish eaters, whereas transients are marine mammal eaters. Uh, not only that, but they also differ in morphology. So their dorsal fins and saddle patches, this patch on their dorsal side, are different in residents and transients, and they can be identified based on photo identification. They also differ in range. Residents have much smaller home ranges, like less than 200 kilometers, whereas transients travel much farther distances. They also differ in social behavior. So residents have this uh, matrilineal structure, and so families stay together for the duration of their lives, uh, whereas transients have more fluid um, dynamics, and so they may group together to hunt, but they largely hunt in very small groups um, and don't necessarily stay with their natal groups. And so, so the one component or the differentiation between residents and transients that I was most interested in is acoustic behavior. And so I have a couple clips here of a resident, some resident vocalizations and transient vocalizations from Glacier Bay, Alaska. And what I want you all to do 
is take a listen and see if you can detect the differences between the resident and transient calls. So here's a resident call. All right, and here is an example of a transient call. Calls. <laughs> so just in those short clips, you should be able to detect a difference in frequency or what we perceive as pitch. So the residents have those higher frequency calls and transients have the lower frequency calls. And this is due in part to their differences, uh, the different types of prey that they consume. So residents are the, eat the fish, right? Like, as I mentioned before, they have that diet specialization. So it, if they produce higher frequency sounds, that's okay, because fish primarily vocalize in the lower frequency ranges. Whereas for transients, they produce these lower frequency calls. Um, and in addition to a variety of other factors, uh, one of the main reasons is marine mammals have very uh, specialized high sensitivity hearing in those higher frequency range, ranges. So they want to remain largely undetected when they're hunting marine mammals. And so that's one of the reasons why they have uh, those, they've been, uh, kind of adapted their vocalizations to have these lower frequency range calls. And so I kind of, as I kind of alluded to before, um, you know, we know a lot about these whales. Um, you know, fairly uh, recently, we've used uh, acoustics to be able to look at what we can understand about behavior. And so kind of starting in the 80s with John Ford, he really laid the foundational work for call traditions and dialects among killer whales um, up in uh, the North Pacific, or North Pacific Northwest, excuse me, uh, and British Columbia. And so he was looking at northern and southern residents as well as west coast transients. He continued this work, and so he, you know, if you ever have looked up a paper about killer whale acoustics, I don't know if any of you have, but I definitely have. Uh, and, you know, he, a lot of the papers either have him as a co-author or he was primary author. Um, he's really laid a lot of the foundational work. And later on, we're seeing more papers on killer whales in Alaska. We're starting to see work on resident killer whales. Uh, more information about transients, those mammal-eating whales in areas like Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. And then we're even starting to see variations in AT1 uh, killer whale subpopulations. And so I kind of listed off a variety of populations. And so I want to give you an idea of you know, where those are located. So I have a map here of the Eastern North Pacific. And I wanted to kind of depict where those stocks are. And so we have the residents here plotted. Um, so we have the more well-known uh, southern residents and northern residents. And we have the Alaska residents here in purple. And then we have transients. And so our known transient groups are uh, the Gulf of Alaska, Aleutian Islands, and Bering Sea transient group, West Coast transients, and a small isolated group of AT1 transients. But although we know a lot about what's going on in the Pacific Ocean, we don't know a lot about what's going on in the Chukchi Sea. And so the Chukchi Sea is a very, one of the most highly productive oceans in the world, and it's home to a variety of species. Um, a lot of species seasonally migrate to the Chukchi Sea because of the food resources um, and productive, productive waters, such as killer whales, uh, fin whales, and gray whales. So lots of baleen species as well as odonocetes. All right. And so I want to give you a couple of objectives to kind of guide my presentation. And so my first objective with this study was to create a vocal catalog of killer whale vocalizations recorded at Point Hope, um, a specific site that I will describe in a moment. And then what I wanted to do is once I described these calls using a vocal catalog, I wanted to identify ecotypes. And it, a lot of times these ecotypes are identified based on visuals, um, so for example, morphology. Um, but I wanted to look at specifically if we could use acoustic indicators like minimum and peak frequency to be able to identify uh, the ecotypes present at this site. And so we predicted that transients would be present at this site, because as I mentioned before, there are lots of marine mammal species that frequent these areas. And so I predicted that likely, and given their range and how far that they can travel, um, I predicted that transients would be present. All right. So I do want to put this out there, although Allison gave a great intro about the Rizzo's work that I've done here, the field work, um, and I'll go into that in a little bit. I do want to acknowledge that these data were not collected by me. I wish I had collected these data. Uh, but these data were collected by NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center and the Marine Mammal Lab out there. And so they conducted um, some acoustic work uh, during an Arctic whale ecology study, ArcWest studies, that occur annually. And so they go out and they deploy uh, deployed moorings at a specific site that I was interested in looking at, PH1, Point Hope. It's about 75 kilometers off of Point Hope, um, off of Alaska. And what they did is they deployed autonomous underwater recorders uh, for acoustic listening. And so this is a picture of the RL here. And this is my, one of my committee members, Jessica Krantz, that was involved in the data collection. 
Um, and they're about to take it off the back deck and attach it to the mooring. And so this recorder was attached to a subsurface mooring um, that was deployed on the seafloor. And so this is a picture of it on the deck. And this is a schematic or a diagram of what those different components look like. And so we have the subsurface float you can see here. This is our uh, oral device, our recorder. We have an acoustic release and then the anchor. So it was suspended, suspended approximately six meters off the seafloor. All right, and so it was sampling at 16 kilohertz with a duty cycle of 85 minutes every five hours in 2013, and it was slightly different. It was 80 minutes every five hours in 2014 and 2015. Um, so if we look at an entire year, that was approximately 30% of the entire year. And so although they had data from 2012 to 2015, um, because they went back every year to deploy and recover the instruments, uh, I was interested in looking at a specific subset of those data. And so I was looking at the summer months between 2013 and 2015, um, because based on some preliminary analysis that the Marine Mammal Lab had done, Alaska Fisheries, uh, they saw this really big peak in killer whale calls uh, during the summer months. And so I was really interested in kind of honing in my study to those specific dates. All right. So as you can imagine, with acoustic recordings, there were a lot of wave files and a lot of data to get through. And that would have taken me a long time, and I wanted to be as efficient as possible. Uh, and so I created an automated detector in MATLAB in order to detect calls in my file. And so I have an example here of what the detector would be doing, but I kind of want to orient you to the different uh, the, uh, the figure here. So the first panel is the spectrogram, so we kind of went over that, right? Time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. Our filtered envelope, and this is just showing amplitude over time. And then the top is the filtered waveform, but we, don't, we won't worry about that for uh, the purposes of this automated detector example. Um, but my threshold was set at 35% of the total uh, noise, the total amplitude. And so you can see here, my threshold is set. And so what the detector would do, it was it would go through the file, and each time it surpassed that threshold, it would extract a call. And so you can see here the detector is going through, it's running through, and th although there are seven calls, it extracts four, you can see successfully. So my detector was not perfect. It did not detect every single vocalization, but enough of a subset to get an idea of diversity of calls uh, and ecotype, which was, were my objectives for this study. And so then I would go through manually and remove any of the false positives so when the detector said, hey, it's a call, and I was like, ah, it's wrong. So I would remove all those, <laughs> take them out, uh, and then what I was left with was a subset of calls to use in my analysis. And so I had a lot of calls to go through. Um, and so I used a real-time odontocy call classification algorithm, RACA, to be able to extract parameters from all these calls. Um, and so how this works is through the program, you're able to select the start of the call, and the end of the call, and then Raka draws a contour of a variety of contour points along the call. And from that, it extracts eight parameters. And these are the eight that I used for my study. So start frequency, it extracted N frequency, N frequency of the call. Minimum frequency, which in the case of this call is the same as the N frequency. Maximum frequency, duration, or the total time of the call. Bandwidth, the change in frequency of the call. Frequency slope mean, uh, so when the, you can kind of see my, my little line trying to show an increasing frequency slope mean or a positive slope mean and a negative slope mean. And then peak frequency. And so for peak frequency, I have a different graph to better exemplify this. And so I have frequency on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis. And you can see that uh, at 1,200 hertz, we have the highest amplitude. So peak frequency, by definition, is the frequency with the highest amplitude. And we can kind of see that if we go back to this figure here, we see at about 120 hertz, we see that you know, really darker color indicating that higher amplitude. So it's doing, it's, it's, it's calculating correctly. That's good. <laughs> all right, and so then once I had all these parameters, I went through and I manually categorized all the calls into six call categories. And so I'm gonna go through all of them here and give you the definition and show you an example of what one of those calls would look like. Uh, and so multi-part calls contained two to four low frequency and high frequency call parts. And so we can see here in my uh, multi-part example, we have a spectrogram, we have high frequency component and a low frequency component. Tonal calls were linear calls with a bandwidth, which remember is that change in frequency um, of less than 225 hertz. And so we can see it's very linear. There's not a lot of change in frequency. Downsweep, however, were descending call contours uh, with higher start frequency than end frequency. 
Upsweep, as you can imagine, was the opposite, ascending call frequency with a lower start frequency than end frequency. Modulated, and these were calls with greater than two modulations. So uh, by definition, one modulation would be one of these little humps here, and so, for example, in this call, we would see four modulations, and then I was able to calculate modulation rate um, from the number of modulations in the call. And then single mod modulation is what it sounds, just a call with one single little hump. All right, and so because I had these call categories, I wanted to develop a more descriptive naming scheme than we've seen in the past. And so these are kind of some examples of some naming schemes and call catalogs from a variety of papers from the 80s to more recently in 2005. And so we see here that these, they have these alphanumerical um, numbering systems. And so, that, for example, in this, we have northern, the N stands for northern resident, and they're chronologically numbered. And this, this can kind of, um, give us a problem as acousticians where we're trying to kind of decipher between calls and compare um, because a lot of these numbering systems are very uh, study specific. So this can be difficult um, to really discern you know, and compare between our call types. And so I proposed creating a more descriptive system um, based on those general contour categories that we just went through. And so I had a location of a recording, the contour category, um, and then a subcategory designation with a one through eight, or however many uh, subcategories were in the file. And so you can see here, I've kind of converted it to my call type names, and so these are gonna be used throughout the talk, and are my abbreviations, or what I propose, can be used in the naming scheme to better categorize calls and make it easier for call comparisons on a larger scale. All right, so now I'm just gonna go through my statistics. So I used a principal component analysis to be able to confirm the call categories that I had in R. And so what this did is it showed me kind of a visual tool, it was a visual tool aid for me to see how these categories clustered out. So all the modulated calls in theory would all cluster out on the PCA. And for example, our, my tonal calls would cluster out and kind of confirm those manually, manual designations that I had made. And then to create subcategories, I used hierarchical cluster analysis in R to subcategorize. Um, and I used something called a gendogram, which are the outputs from the, that cluster analysis. And it's like a tree that shows similarities among parameters. So you can input a variety of parameters, and then it will uh, give you an output of a gendogram that shows you similarity among a variety, um, and in my case, of calls. And then I used a one-way ANOVA and two-key post-hoc test to be able to look at similarities between ecotypes of other papers and to compare my own call categories. All right. So I want to go into these results and kind of give you a summary of everything that we, you know, we collected and what we saw um, from the acoustic analysis portion of this. And so out of 1,798 hours of recordings, which are a lot, uh, my detector uh, detected 1,315 calls, which may sound like a lot, um, but I just, you know, my detector wasn't perfect, so there, this is likely an underrepresentation of the total um, calls. Um, but this gave us a really large sample size to be able to work from. Um, and we saw a peak in July, which was interesting. So approximately 76% of all the data occurred in July. And you can see from this graph, from our percentage of days with call and each year, the July, you can really see that peak, especially in 2013 and 2015. And calling occurred on 38 days of a total 275 days that we looked at, so nine months. And if I look, I was interested in looking at the distribution of days with those calls. And we can see here that we have these kind of clumps of days when killer whales are likely passing through the area. So we're hearing more vocalizations, and then there's a lot of time when they're not around. So they may be passing through, especially in July 2013. We're really seeing this concentrated time period when a lot of vocalizations were made. All right, and so these are the results from my PCA, Principal Component Analysis. Um, we're always looking at the clustering of those different call types. Um, and so you can see here, I used a variety of parameters, not all of them, but start and frequency, minimum frequency, maximum frequency, and peak frequency, in order to look at how those clustered out. And we can see here, there is some clustering. We see that the tonal calls are very distinct right here in the center. Um, we have our multi-part calls that are clustering out. It's harder to see because there's a lot of overlap. A lot of those vocalizations are in similar frequency ranges. But we do see this clustering, which is largely driven by the maximum and minimum frequency um, that we can see from this PC1 um, explained variance value right here of about 73%. So a lot of that variance is happening in the maximum minimum frequency, which makes sense um, because a lot of our calls can vary uh, from category to category. 
All right, and so these were my large call categories, but then as I discussed, I wanted to look at subcategories which it, within each of those larger categories. And so the hierarchical cluster analysis provided me with these dendrograms, these outputs that allow me to see these relationships uh, between calls. And so for example, this is the down sweep uh, dendrogram, and we see four call category, categories and one variable category. So it's the most extant group within this tree. Um, and you can really see here there's some distinct clustering happening, and I kind of added these color bubbles to give you a better idea. But even if you looked at this without the color bubbles, you would really see those distinct groupings. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I'm gonna go through the call catalog that I developed. I give you some examples of the calls um, and give you a really brief, uh, an overview of everything that we heard at the recordings. All right, so our CH2 tonal calls, um, this call category had eight subcategories. We can see the spectrograms here. Um, and it was the most common call type. Uh, there were 607 of the total data, and we know that there are 1,315 total calls. So this made up approximately half of the total calls. So that was a large proportion were of tonal calls. And they were produced on the majority of days, 35 out of the 38 days. And I have a couple examples here, and I amplified these sounds. So the background noise may be a little bit loud, but I wanted to get, make sure that you heard the, the call a little bit better. So here's an example of a CHT4 call and a CHT5 call. Very short. <laughs> All right. Um, so these multi-part calls were really interesting. At, and I'll kind of talk about this later, but they were very unique. I couldn't find any call types that look similar to these in other call cat uh, catalogs, which is interesting. And so these were the second most common call type. Um, they were produced um, on many days, but not as many as the tonal calls. Um, and they made approximately 25% of the total calls produced. And we can see here, uh, we had 11 subcategories, so the most subcategories of anyone. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that this call category was not, um, was not automated. So it didn't go through the dendrogram uh, hierarchical cluster analysis process. I did it manually, because as you can see, there's so many different components. It's hard when you're um, trying to to deal with all those factors and incorporate all these different parts. And so because they were highly stereotyped, I felt comfortable enough to manually categorize these guys. So here are a couple of examples of a CHP1 call and a CHP4 call. And it's really hard to kind of uh, uh, distinguish between the different parts because they're so short in duration, um, but they are there. There are four parts and the CHP4 call, and there were only two parts, um, a low frequency and high frequency component part in the CHP1 call category. All right, so moving on to downsweep, um, there were four downsweep call categories and one variable category, and so these all had a negative mean slope, which makes sense since the definition of the downsweep calls were negative slopes, um, and they were produced on 20 days, and we had a total of 178 of these guys, of the downsweep calls. Um, and so I have two examples, a CHD3 call. And here's a CHD4 call. Uh, notice the differences in coloration. This is going to be a little bit louder, so just bear with me. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to the upsweep calls. Um, so this call uh, category had six subcategories. Um, with positive mean slope, 92 calls on 20 days. And so these were uh, less frequent than the other call types, but nonetheless, uh, still very interesting. CHU2. Right. And this is CHU6. Very short in duration. <laughs> All right. Uh, Arguably my favorite call type, the modulated calls. Uh, there were five subcategories and one variable category. Um, and so the average modulation rate was 3.6 modulations per second, which is less than others reported um, in other papers. Um, there were 60 of these calls, and they were produced on nine of the 38 days. Um, and here's an example of a CHM4 call. All right, and leaving the least common call type for last, uh, single modulation calls were produced on 11 days, and we had a total of 31 in this call type, call category, excuse me. Uh, and here's an example of a CHS1 call. 
very short, very different than the previous one, right? <laughs> All right, and so when I look at comparisons between call categories, I wanted to look at all the parameters. Um, and so I pr created box plots to better visualize um, the differences between call categories. I do not want you to digest this. This is a lot to digest, I understand. So I'm gonna break it up a little bit so we can look at kind of some of the key features and interesting points um, from uh, this analysis. Uh, and so for end frequency, the upsweep frequency calls had a significantly higher frequency than all the other call types. And that kind of makes sense. Even kind of listening back and looking at the spectrograms, you can see that these upsweep calls are higher in frequency. Oops, excuse me. All right. Uh, frequency slope means, so upsweep calls uh, had a greater, a significantly greater uh, frequency slope mean than tonal calls, but that also makes sense, right? Our tonal calls are gonna have a very small frequency slope mean, close to zero, right? Because there shouldn't be changing very much, much along the frequency axis. Uh, when we're looking at bandwidth, so that's the change in frequency during the, the call, tonal calls had a significantly lower bandwidth than all other call types, which this also makes sense because the tonal calls should not have a very large bandwidth. We're trying to, just by definition, it was supposed to be less than 225. And so duration, uh, the multi-part calls were significantly shorter in duration than all other call types. And I think that is primarily due to the fact that uh, included a lot of the, all the other little baby low frequency components. I don't know if you noticed on the figure there, um, we had these high frequency and low frequency components that were milliseconds in duration. And so when we were combining those, I think that was skewing it a bit. That's why we get the really low duration in the multi-part calls because of those little itty bitty parts that are included. All right, and then peak frequency, uh, multi-part calls had a significantly lower peak frequency than downsweep, upsweep, and modulated call types. And then, in addition to uh, those calls, tonal calls had a significantly lower peak frequency than upsweep calls. And so this also makes sense. This is tied to this end frequency. All, you know, all these frequencies are related. And so that makes sense that these two um, would kind of fall out in these data. And so these comparisons really show relationships between calls and the variation in the parameters just within this data set. All right, and so now I wanna move on to kind of the second objective of my thesis, which was to see if we could determine ecotype based on these vocalizations. And so um, I compare my data to a variety of studies, a few studies that have been done, um, looking at comparing transients, offshore killer whales, and residents. And so this first paper is by Foote and Nystuen in 2007, and what they were interested in looking at is a differentiation between ecotypes. And so they used a subsample of 30 calls uh, of transients, offshore, and resident calls. And so I, what I did is I wanted to look at how my data compared and see if there was any overlap, and if we could determine, based on a scatter plot, uh, where those differences lie. And so my data are in red, and you can see that they're much lower, just in general, uh, than the peak frequencies and minimum frequencies um, that are plotted in this graph, and the subset that was used and put in nice tune. And so uh, the minimum frequency was significantly lower than the offshore ecotype. Um, and so you can kind of see here, we have this, it's really, really being drawn, it's much lower in that minimum frequency range. Um, and our peak frequency, you can see here along the y-axis, um, was significantly lower than these groupings of transients, offshores, and residents. So there was a significant difference. They were significantly lower. Um, and I think this is in part due to the fact that the way they were collecting their data um, differed a little bit. They were extracting peak frequency in a different way. And so if I had extracted my peak frequency in the way they did, um, they were looking at peak frequency um, within one to 10 hertz, so within the entire frequency spectrum, whereas I was only looking at that first fundamental frequency contour, that lowest contour. And so that may have uh, caused my data to be a slightly lower on the peak frequency spectrum. So if I, if I had collected my data in the way they did and extracted my peak frequency parameter in the same way, we might have seen uh, an, kind of an upward shift in these data. And so there may have been more overlap with transient and resident whales. All right, but this isn't a great example um, because they did not use any Alaskan whales in their analysis. And so instead I decided to look at Phil Litova et al. in 2015. And so she did a comparison looking at peak frequencies um, between North Atlantic, resident, and transient whales. And we can see here when my Chuck GC data is plotted with these data, there's really this distinct overlap in transients. And it's really clear um, that my data aligns more with the transients, which included Alaskan transients in her data set. Um, so that makes sense of maybe why that would be a better comparison. We can look at these data in a different way. And so kind of looking back at the way that the RACA extracted those contour points, 
At each of those contour points, it extracted a peak frequency. And those peak frequency values can be plotted on a histogram. And so this is from Filatova et al. She used the same method and she plotted her histogram points or contour points on a histogram and was looking at the differences between four different resident populations, um, northern and southern residents, Kamachka uh, residents, which are Russian resident whales, and Alaskan residents. And then she also was looking at transient whales. And as we can see here, just in the differences in distribution of the histograms, we can see this initial peak and then the second peak at a higher frequency range, around eight to 10 kilohertz. And so we see this bi bimodal distribution in resident whales. Um, but when we look at transients, we only see this unimodal distribution. You don't really see that second peak that is occurring in the resident uh, histograms. And so when I plotted my data in the same way that she did, and we're looking at histograms, you see this unimodal peak. And so this aligns the most closely with the transient whales um, and that uh, unimodal distribution. And so this is, to me, really great confirmation that these whales are likely transients. And so I just kind of want to go through um, the discussion. Uh, so kind of in summary, on 38 days, we had recordings of killer whale. And so we can, I think it's safe to say that there are occasional occurrence at Point Hope. Um, and, but this is likely an underestimate of presence um, for a variety of reasons. One, I kind of mentioned the duty cycle of the recorder. Because it was only recording 30% of the time, we may not have captured all the vocalizations that were being made. My missed call rate of the detector, my detector wasn't perfect, I missed calls, um, and this might have also contributed to it being an underestimate of total presence. And there's also this difference in ecotype um, of vocal behavior. So we see that residents vocalize much more than transients. Uh, they're very, very social, whereas transients primarily vocalize after a kill. So they're not vocalizing as frequently, so it some, can sometimes not necessarily be the best way to identify presence if they're just being super sneaky and quiet and trying not to be detected, so. All right, um, so as far as our ecotype determination, I uh, identified that transients uh, were present based on our call comparisons, and so my hypothesis was correct. Ooh. I guess I'll explain these in a minute. So in addition to the call comparisons and looking at those uh, various publications, we also identified some non-call sounds in the data. And so these are called flu cavitations, and they're these low frequency sounds um, that are produced when a whale accelerates really rapidly and its flukes um, are, are moving so quickly that it creates this cavitation bubble um, in the water and it produces these really low frequency sounds. And these are, have been known to commonly be made um, during attacks of killer whales on gray whales, for example, when they're head ramming and flukes slapping and being uh, really violent uh, towards gray whales. And <laughs> there's, a, there's a really scary video. I did not include it. I could have, but, uh, and these fluke cavitations are often uh, occurring during that time, since you can hear them in the recordings. And so this was also confirmed by personal communication with John Ford. Very exciting stuff to have him respond uh, to my email. <laughs> asking him what these were, uh, so that was kind of a, a big highlight for me. Uh, <laughs> all right, and then something else that I really wanted to touch on is that these calls are extremely unique. When I was going through and making, trying to make call comparisons with other vocal catalogs that were available, there was n really no comparison that I could make. There were certain parts of calls that looked similar, but there were no exact matches. And so I think that's something um, that's very important about these data is this really opens up you know, the diversity of the call catalogs that we're seeing uh, in killer whales. And, providing us with new data. And so as far as implications, as I mentioned before, there are many baleen whale species that occur in the summer months um, at the Chukchi Sea. And so gray whales are one of the prey species of killer whales, or one of the primary prey species. And we can see here this wonderful graph provided to me by Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Um, we have sea ice in blue. So we have a sea ice cover, and so there's no animals around during sea ice cover, which makes sense killer whale in green, and gray whale in black. And so we can see this relationship between when there are killer whales present and when there are gray whales present, um, which is likely due to prey availability. So killer whales are moving into this area to likely feed. And so kind of going back to my map of what we don't know about the Chukchi Sea, potentially with you know, the knowledge of these new data, maybe there's an extension. Maybe we're seeing these whales up in this area and we can think about you know, how this, these implications for management, um, stock assessment, as we're seeing, uh, hearing them and acoustically detecting them uh, in these uh, northern latitudes. 
And so, and, and you know, this really links back to you know understanding the distribution of ecotypes is really essential in initiating targeted management, um, especially during this time when things like global warming are happening. And so, this is an image from Stafford 2019 that ra recently came out, um, and this is June through November, and this is sea ice cover in the Chukchi Sea. And so. In uh, white, we have 2015, and in blue, we have 1985. And can, you can see in June and November in 1985, there was total ice cover in June and November. But now in 2015, what we're seeing is that that sea ice is receding much quicker. And so it's leaving a larger open water period. Um, and so these animals are able to go into this area and it could have larger implications on prey species um, like baleen whales, and specifically gray whales. Um, and this is also important for human subsidies. So humans um, at Point Hope, Point Hope is actually one of the, uh, the oldest whaling villages um, that still exist, um, and they still hunt to this day. And so it's important to kind of acknowledge that, that you know, it's not, they're not only impacting the ecosystem, they could potentially be impacting humans as well um, that you know, rely on species like gray whales or bowhead whales, the killer whales are also known to attack. And so this is something that's kind of important as we're thinking about strategic management of killer whales up in the Chukchi Sea. And this work really provides the first comprehensive description of call types for killer whales um, in this region, which I think is super exciting. It was super frustrating you know, as an acoustician when you're going through and you have nothing to compare it to, but I think this is really exciting work and I hope that um, future studies, I encourage future studies to include things like uh, file clips, things that people can use um, and more descriptive data. Because a lot of times, as you saw in previous spectrograms in the 1980s, you have these black and white spectrograms that don't look so great, and then you have to kind of figure out parameters based on those pictures alone. And so I think you know, providing more information will really be helpful uh, in future acoustic work. And you know, ultimately, I think these data can serve as a baseline uh, for future acoustic work on killer whales in the Arctic. All right. So this would typically be the end of my uh, thesis presentation, but as uh, Allison alluded to, and as many of you know, I conducted a Rizzo's pilot study out here in the Monterey Bay, and I want to devote a little bit of time talking to it, because as she said, I'm very passionate about it. It was my little project, uh, and I want to just kind of speak a little bit about this. And so this is me and one of my awesome fellow lab mates and volunteers, Jenny, and we're out, and this is, I think, one of the first days I think the first day we went out, we drove out, found a Rizzo's group like right away. Uh, so super exciting. As if you don't know, it's kind of hard to see from these dorsal fins, but if you're not familiar with what Rizzo's dolphin look like, super cute, right? <laughs> uh, and so what, we, what I wanted to do was I wanted to conduct an acoustic study of Rizzo's dolphin out here in the Monterey Bay. So little is known about Rizzo's. Um, if you look up in Google Scholar, Rizzo's vocalizations, I think you could probably pull two papers. Uh, and there are very little known about what's occurring out here in the Monterey Bay, uh, virtually nothing acoustically. And so what I was interested in doing was looking at acoustics and behavior uh, and trying to link those two. And so a little in, you know, bird's eye view into the process. Uh, this is a video, thank you, Mason. Uh, he strapped a GoPro to the rib, pretty cool, right? So you get this video of us round the bay. It's a typical summer morning in Monterey Bay, gray. As you can see, oh, we've encountered a group of dolphins. And so what we were interested in collecting were uh, photo identification. So we have lots of photos. Maybe a future intern can go through all of them, thousands. Uh, acoustic data and behavioral data. And so um, we're out in the water. We have Holly on photo, Allison also on photo, and Mason doing, some, doing the behavioral data. And so what I would do is I would get the hydrophone, we'd deploy it. Um, and then as the animals moved away, we would pull up the hydrophone, retrieve it, and then redeploy it as we kind of maneuvered around the animals. And so this is kind of like a day in the life. <laughs> and then get the hydrophone in there. And so I was specifically interested in looking at the acoustic as aspect of this project. Um, but before I kind of go into that, I think this is pretty interesting. I just kind of wanted to show our boat track uh, throughout 2017. Uh, and in black is our total boat track, red is during when we had encounters with Rizzo's dolphin, and yellow are the days highlighted when we had recordings of Rizzo's. A good recording is where we can actually, I could actually identify vocalizations. And so we're all over the place. <laughs> all right, and so what we were interested in looking at is with surface active behaviors, um, one of which being tail slapping which we saw out there. 
one's tail flapping a lot. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little wobbly. I'm trying to, you know, keep from getting seasick and hold on to my phone. Yeah. And breaching was another surface active behavior. And these were just a couple of the examples um, of surface active behaviors that we were recording out there. And so, oh, there it goes. So, I want to provide you with some preliminary results. And I, and I, you know, kind of say this as a pilot study because, unfortunately, I didn't have enough high quality acoustic recordings for this to be part of my thesis. Um, but I wanted to provide you with a few examples of what I was looking for. And so in these recordings, I was looking for whistles, uh, which we see here on the right, I mean on the left, excuse me. Here's an example. Sorry, they're very quiet. That was another problem, they're super quiet. Uh, and a whistle burst pulse example. And so a whistle burst pulse is when the whistle and a burst pulse call are occurring at the same time. And this was something unique to Rizzo's dolphin, which I was interested in looking at. and they occur simultaneously. And this is fairly unique in repertoires um, of odonocetes, and so I was interested in looking at percentages. Um, is the repertoire dominated by whistles or whistle burst pulses? Uh, and we found that 23% of total vocalizations were whistles, and so this was just based on a manual count that I went through after amplifying the files to be able to determine the whistles versus whistle burst pulses, and 9% of total vocalizations were these whistle burst pulse, burst pulses. And so just going through my preliminary results, I plotted surface active behavior and vocal rates from these numbers. And we can see that there's kind of this peak um, during times when we have higher surface active rate and vocal rate. Um, so we have one here. Um, and sometimes it kind of, it, there was a relationship and sometimes not. We saw more surface active behaviors than vocal rate. Um, but we can see on these three days we had some pretty high vocal rates. Um, and so kind of ultimately as a conclusion, I would love for someone to continue these work, and maybe someday for another project, I will continue these work, but, um, this work, but I think more high quality recordings are needed, and Rizzo's are just difficult. Uh, and finding them, getting out, recording them, and, and getting enough recordings I think is really important, and so that's something that I hope that somebody can kind of run with in the future, because I think it still needs to be done. There still needs to be a paper out on Rizzo's in the Monterey Bay and acoustics. Uh, so with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, so many people. Uh, <laughs> so many people. <laughs> okay. Uh, I sorry. I will try to not make this go on forever. Uh, but I want to first acknowledge um, and thank my committee members. And so I want to start off with uh, Allison. Where is she? Oh, there she is. Okay. Allison, um, thank you so much. I am just honored to be your first student, and I want to say that she's actually. Uh, I think hiring on a new student or getting a new student as I'm leaving and you know they were asking me about Allison and I would always tell them like I couldn't have asked for a better advisor. Um, she's been so supportive of me throughout this whole process. Uh, she's been so supportive of me throughout this whole process and um, I just couldn't have done this without you. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, but she's amazing like just getting back to me on things, helping me when I'm stuck. Um, when I felt like I couldn't code anymore. Uh, she, was, <laughs> she was there and helping me along the way, and I couldn't have asked for someone better, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss you. <laughs> uh, Gita, um, you also are just, oh gosh, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, very emotional. Uh, Gita, you're just such a ray of light. Like, I, even at all of our lab meetings, you're always so positive and wonderful, and you're just such a support system for all of us. As Sharon mentioned in her talk earlier, uh, you really are just our go-to for so many things. And, you know, especially on this project, your expertise in writing and statistics really, really helped me. And just even taking your field class, I learned so much just even being on the field and being involved in elephant seal work, which I never thought that I would do. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Um, Tom, I took so many classes with you, Tom, and I want to say the majority of these figures are because of Tom, because of his Python course. Uh, so a lot of the figures you see here are because of him and his stats courses and oceanography classes. I just really appreciate all your support getting back to me when I have questions on statistics and coding. Um, and so I really thank you for that. And Jessica Krantz, who could not be here today, she's actually flying back from the Ray Mammal Conference in Barcelona. Um, but I mean, I couldn't have done this without her. She provided me these data, as you saw in the photo earlier. She collected all these data that I used um, for my thesis, 
when I was super stuck with a lot of these analyses, she was so supportive and there and able to answer questions and seeking answers for me when I was feeling really stuck. And so I just couldn't have asked for a better committee. And so that just kind of speaks volumes to Moss Landing Marine Labs and the wonderful uh, faculty that we have here and staff, which I will go into a minute. Uh, and then I also just want to acknowledge the Alaska Fisheries Science Center Lab for providing with these data. Uh, when I went back, actually, a couple years ago, or like a year and a half ago, or maybe a year ago, I collected more data. And so um, Bryn and Jenna were really instrumental in helping me get those data from them. Catherine Burchick, which who is the head of this project, for looking at drafts and giving me feedback and providing pictures and always being a support system. I really appreciated her expertise um, and her input, especially you know the NOAA uh, from the NOAA side of things, and all the field technicians and folks and crew that were out there collecting these data. The Vertebrate Ecology Lab, man, I know Sharon mentioned this in her talk, but uh, you guys are just so awesome. Vertebrate Ecology Lab, like, such a great group of people. Not only are they amazing scientists, but they're just amazing human beings. Uh, like she mentioned, my entire lab was here for my practice talk and during finals week, and so that just, it's crazy, like so supportive and giving me feedback and always just being so positive and I really appreciate all of them. Um, some of whom have graduated, um, but some that are still here, all of you um, have really just been so helpful throughout this process. Um, I want to thank the Moss Landing faculty and all the people that, you know, taught me in courses and who I interacted with, whether it be on student body um, or uh, taking courses. Marine Ops, I think I saw JD here today. <laughs> Hi, JD. So as you saw me driving the boat, um, this would, that would not have been possible without JD. And um, I think one of the best experiences I had was learning how to drive the boat. It was something that I wanted to take away from us landing. And here's a, one of the only pictures I have of us. <laughs> um, this is JD making sure I don't hit the dock <laughs> uh, at small boats training. I think I got a little bit better, um, but <laughs> uh, but he was so helpful, always you know helping me with scheduling, helping me get trained so I could go offshore and do this work that I wanted to do. And so I thank you so much for that, JD. Uh, Brian as well, and all the guys at Marine Ops. Jackson, I don't know if he's here. He actually there he is. <laughs> Brian and Jackson, Jackson for coming out with me, helping me uh, with little things, if letting me know when you know the rib was getting fixed or anything. He just kept me in the loop, and I so appreciate that. And even having him come out with me, that was great. Uh, and then Brian for checking me off. I don't know if he's here in the audience, but I will always remember him and I. We were on the boat. We were coming back from him checking me off from offshore cert. And uh, we saw this lunch, this lunch feeding, like this humpback whale, right next to us. And we were both like, whoa. We both looked at each other. It was right at the mouth of the, the harbor. It was pretty cool. So facilities, guys, I want to thank James. Uh, Again, Sharon mentioned this in her talk, but they're so supportive of us. And, and James is always looking out for, you know, for me, if I was, I was here late in the lab, he'd be like, hey, are you okay? Coming in, checking in, uh, making sure I was all right. Uh, and, you know, whether that be other things too, like when I wanted a forklift tables to the volleyball court, like he's, <laughs> I had crazy ideas sometimes. So he was so supportive of me, helped me, you know, when, you know, things with student body. And so I really appreciate him. Moss Landing staff, Tara, Michelle, Kathleen, uh, all three of you, Tara, it's just what would we do without Tara? Everybody needs a Tara in their life. Uh, uh, Michelle for helping me when I, when I come into her office multiple times asking about funding and how everything works and travel. You were always so willing, even when you had so much going on, to help me out, and I really appreciate that. Uh, Kathleen, our mutual love of killer whales. I think we bonded over that. I don't know where she is, but yes. Uh, and so in all her help with everything uh, you know, that I did here, especially with student body and during my time here, I so appreciate that. Stephanie Flora for being willing to help me with my coding. Uh, when things weren't working with my detector, I sent her a frantic email like, can you help me? And she did, she's such a miracle worker. And so I so appreciate that. I do have to thank John Ford and James Pilkington for their helpful insight into some of my recordings uh, when I needed some feedback. All the fieldwork volunteers, which I will 
talk about in a minute. I have some, some pictures I want to show. Um, but all of the people that came out, Mason, Jenny, Sharon, Heather, Rachel, Holly, Kristen, Sean, Lauren, Julie, uh, one of our, uh, Julia, one of our interns, Kate, Grant, another intern, Kimberly, my sister came out and helped me out, uh, Char, <laughs> and Alex Olson, who went out and helped train me one day. Um, I really appreciate all of your time and effort that you put into that project, and I'm sorry that I couldn't have like made it a part of my thesis, and it couldn't have been more, but to me it was more. Um, I just, I gained so much for that, and I just loved being out on the water with all of you. Uh, so, and then I also want to thank all the Monterey Bay Whale Watch captains who uh, inadvertently helped me find Rizzo's, uh, so we'd be out on the water, and someone would be like, hey, we have Rizzo's at coordinates such and such, and I'd be like, oh, guys, let's go. And they were the reason that we found a lot of the Rizzo's, so I do have to send a send a shout out to all the captains, even though they're, they're not here today. But, uh, and I also want to thank the employment, um, the people that kept me working and funded during my time here. Uh, I was inv I've been involved with the NOAA project, and a couple of folks that I worked with are here today, which I'm so excited about, um, on a rockfish acoustic project. And so that really helped, not only helped with you know, funding sources, but more than that, provided me with you know, a greater diversity of, of, of knowledge in acoustics, not just right now. Because you know, I can be very focused, but it was nice to get some fish, fish acoustic experience. Uh, the Sanctuary Exploration Center, I have so enjoyed my time here. And they're so supportive. There's so many volunteers I have here today. Uh, and I thank you so much for being here. Uh, and then the front desk for also employing me during my time. I think you know, it's so great that Moss Landing has these employment opportunities for students. Um, to get us through, and so I thank you all for that. Um, funding, I just want to acknowledge my funding sources, um, the Zivius Martin Scholarship Award, um, and Marlene is, I think, in the audience today. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and Sony Linick Hamilton Marine Science Scholarship, Simpkins, um, and a variety of others that were helpful in me being able to conduct my Rizzo's research and my hydrophone and all the equipment necessary for that project. And with that said, here are some photos of my orange crew out on the water. <laughs> All these folks helped me out on numerous days out there in the cold, driving around for hours, not finding Rizzo's, and they were such troopers and just amazing people to work with. Uh, having any of these people on your field team, you'd, you'd be good to go. Uh, they're all extremely capable, wonderful humans. And one human that I want to acknowledge uh, that came out with me on, I think I counted 13 of the total days. We, I think we went out in 2017, like 18, maybe 17 or 18 days. Most days, he was out there with me, Mason. <laughs> that guy, yeah. <laughs> I could not have done this work without Mason. Uh, Mason is wonderful, he, wonderful person. Uh, not only an amazing scientist, but a wonderful human being. And the fact that he came out with me for hours as driving around, I just could you know, not ask for more. So thank you so much, Mason. OK, I'm not going to cry. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I will cry. Um, so you know, the, there's one side of Moss Landing, which is the academic side. It's the side that we, where we get stressed. And there's so many emotions, but there are also all the wonderful times uh, that we get to have here because of all the events um, that are planned here that really foster this camaraderie and commute, sense of community at Moss Landing. And all of these people um, that are in these pictures, whether that be my cohort, um, people in my lab that really have enhanced this experience for me, and I couldn't have asked for a better experience at Moss Landing because of all the people in this slide. And so, um, thanks. And for going along with our like, idea to have, like, you know, my cohort's amazing. They all said, okay, we'll do Disney characters one year. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so uh, I just, you know, want to acknowledge all the, the people that have really made my experience really special here. Um, and finally, I just want to thank uh, my family, uh, which are here today. Uh, as you know, as most of you know in the audience, uh, grad school can be very emotional uh, and stressful. And so uh, they were so understanding throughout this whole time. I thank you guys so much for you know dealing with me on holidays when I couldn't do fun things because I was like furiously working on my thesis um, and being understanding. And as many of you can probably relate. Uh, and so I just want to you know thank them and thank um, my aunt and my cousins for being here today too and supporting me. Um, uh, and so with that, I want to say thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I would love to take them now.
Bree, so um, do you know what the range, the detection range is for the, the recorder in the check sheet? Mm -hmm. uh, so it can be really hard to determine that, but the NOAA folks um, say that they use about, uh, I think, 10 miles for the recorder. So, and that's 10 miles for the highest frequencies. And so that's kind of their, um, the range that they kind of go with or that they estimate um, that the recorder can detect. Um, and so, yeah, approximately 10 miles. So fairly far, um, but again, that's also another possibility with my recordings is that, you know, if they're not loud enough, you may, we may be missing them just because it's a stationary recorder. That's kind of one of the caveats of the question that deals with that is, so what it was, I missed maybe what you said was a sample set. What, what, what was a sample when you were doing the statistical test, testing between the different, are you talking about number of calls, calls in a day, one call per day? You mean the p-value the, the p comparison, yeah. like the call categories? Those yeah. are based on all the calls in each of the categories. So they're theoretically based multiple calls from the same individual? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And what, what would that do? So yeah, that could potentially affect things for sure. And, and I, I, need to, I acknowledge that definitely. Uh, and that's actually highly likely, I would say, that they're being produced, especially a lot of those stereotyped uh, multi-part calls. They were just listening to the recordings and what I know about them, they were very repetitive and usually on one or two days specifically. And so yes, they're likely produced by individuals, so that's something definitely to consider, I think improving the detector. There's a variety of ideas that I have to improve the study and get an even better idea of what's going on in the diversity, but yes, that definitely would have influenced things. Because it's hard with a stationary acoustic mooring, you can't differentiate individuals, you don't have any visual, big resight data, so that makes things challenging. Emily? You know there's some differences between individuals, but I think this might be a good question, but like, can you tell the difference between potentially a male and a female whale, even though you don't have like visuals here, this is all passive, do they have different frequencies? Or uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, yeah, that would be really interesting to look at. And I don't know, I mean, in the wild, that would be extremely difficult. I mean, I think maybe if you were like, managed care setting, uh, had animals, you know, captive animals, you could potentially look at differences. Um, I've never seen a paper on killer whale looking at different differences in uh, gender, but that's interesting. But I do not know of any differences between gender. But that is interesting to think about, that that could be a thing. Um, yeah, I don't. Kind of related. Um, could you tell if a baby was trying to vocalize? Just like, uh, like trying to <laughs> Not doing a good job. Yeah, so um, some of the, that's actually interesting. So in dolphins, uh, what, well, so killer whales are dolphins, but bottlenose dolphins, sorry. Uh, they oftentimes, when they're younger, yeah, they're trying to figure things out. They're not vocalizing super clear, and so they create kind of these um, warbled kind of type sounds. Um, and they sound a little more muffled, and when you look at them on a spectrogram, they look a little bit more chaotic, and you don't necessarily, you can't see a clean contour. Um, in my vocalizations, I didn't see any of that. I think if I, because it went through the detector and kind of extracted um, those clear calls, it may have missed things like that, depending on you know how uh, kind of sporadic those sounds were. My detector could have missed that, um, but I didn't detect any of that. But that's definitely something that happens when with younger animals, is they have this kind of they're trying to figure things out, so it, they it sound a little bit different. <laughs> That was great for you. You're fabulous. <laughs> um, did those sensors pick up what other dolphin calls in the area, and like, how do you distinguish? <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, the recorder picked up a ton of stuff. Uh, a lot of baleen whales, and so the targeted species for the Arc West surveys um, are baleen whale species. And so Odonoses is typically not what they're focusing on, which is why I wanted to kind of go in that direction. Um, but you hear like bearded seal in the recordings, lots of different types of species. And because you know, we know what a lot of those vocalizations sound like, there's papers out that kind of detect, yeah, have like these kind of mini call catalogs that allow us to kind of see these vocalizations. I was able to kind of distinguish them. Um, there were some whistles in the recordings. I, I didn't look at whistles specifically, uh, and I didn't identify them to species level. I could have. Um, but when I got, went through all of my recordings in the RACA program, it, ex it has like a species classifier and it classified my species as Orsinus orca. So that's kind of further confirmation that they weren't something else. Um, there were some <coughs> little parts of them that uh, had other, like 
a very small percentage had like Pacific white-sided dolphin because they have kind of similar um, sounding calls, um, but they were like the tiny parts, so it's hard for the detector to actually classify correctly, but yes. with Jessica, we think that instead of it being a, like a new subset or a new, not ecotype, uh, but population of killer whales that are out there vocalizing this unique type of, you know, subset of vocalizations, we think that it's likely an extension of the Alaskan Bering Sea, because we really know very little about that transient Alaskan population. And so it's likely that we just know so little that this is just their, ca their call catalog, and we didn't you know, know that these vocalizations exist before, but now we do, and we can start adding them to that larger grouping, because those animals definitely go up into the Chukchi Sea. This has been um, documented for some time, but just not acoustically, and they're very little. I think I could find like six call descriptions of Gulf of Alaska whales, but nothing else of transients in the area. So I think this is just kind of the first steps in creating something like that. But it would be cool if I could actually say, you know, this is a a new population out there that they're vocalizing, you know, this super unique repertoire, but I don't think we can say that yet with these data, but hopefully with a larger data set, maybe looking at the full year, we can get a better idea. What are the pros and cons of using like, a stationary acoustic, like meter like this for using acoustic tags when targeting a specific species? Interesting, yeah. So tags are a much better way to look at, you know, where the animals are going. Sometimes you can get like clearer vocalizations, right? They're vocalizing right there, the tags there. And it's still hard with tags to identify the individual, so that is kind of a challenge um, when you're uh, looking at tag data. But moorings are definitely hard. You just, you know, it's sitting there, and whatever passes by, it's going to record. And so if you wanted to get a better idea, um, tagging would be a good thing. Having an array out there to look at the directionality of the whales and where those sounds are coming from would also help. But tagging is it's awesome. And I would love to tag killer whales. <laughs> Super expensive, you need a lot of funding, um, but that would definitely be something that uh, would be useful in the acoustic side of things for sure. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you. <laughs>